Okay, go ahead, Mr. Presley. You're on mute, Mr. Presley. Now off mute. Good evening. I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. Let's start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please take your seats. Uh, we have six board members here. Uh, Mr. Rajat, I believe, will be joining shortly. That's the only announcements from me. Uh, let's start off. Uh, can Bob, we... I'm here. Oh, we're now at seven. Thank you very much, Christina. Yeah, I've been here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have seven. Uh, and at this point, uh, this is a different meeting because it is time for uh, our budget hearing. And so uh, this is something we do during the budget to allow the community time to talk about it and share their perspective. Uh, I'll read the standard language. This is an opportunity for district residents to ask questions or share comments about the proposed 2020-2021 budget. Because this meeting is being held remotely, if you are a district resident, please send questions and comments via boe at shenschools.org. I'll say that again, boe at shenschools.org. All questions, comments come into the public information officer and are shared with the board president, superintendent, and the assistant superintendent for finance. Questions related to the proposed budget will be answered after the presentation. Any other questions will be relayed to the BOE president superintendent for response within the next two business days. Any questions? Okay, so at this point, uh, we'll move towards the budget hearing. Are there any comments or questions on this? So, Mr. Presley, you want me to um, go ahead? Certainly, go ahead, please. So at this point, I'll share my screen. Um, please allow me to go into present mode. So on the screen at this point, you should see the board agenda. And on the agenda is the link to the budget hearing presentation. Mr. Presley, can you just acknowledge that you're able to see this presentation? Yes, I can see it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will be doing a portion of the presentation and then Mrs. Chase will continue the presentation. As noted, um, the Board of Education adopted this budget proposal back on May 19th. And as a part of the process, we are now here with a budget hearing. And the next step of the process will be the budget vote itself. As you can see on this first slide, um, the focus is in terms of how we strategically use our resources as a school community, uh, focus on three primary areas. How, how can we be more inclusive, addressing the, the diverse needs that we have and doing it in such a way that's very axiomatic. In other words, addressing the various needs of all kids as much as possible. This first slide is essentially the mission statement of the school district in a graphical format. Um, in terms of ensuring that as we look at the budget, it's about engagement, student voice and choice. It's about innovation. How do we ensure that what we do as a school district is personally relevant to our students? It's about cultural competence, ensuring that we have opportunities that preserve equity and opportunities and outcomes for all our students. It's about global collaboration in, tour, in, terms, of, in terms of how we prepare our students to be civic minded learners. And finally, it's about collective work and responsibility as a school community, the partnerships that we value. This is the district fiscal responsibility goal. And the one piece I would just like to emphasize on this is that fiscal responsibility is exercised by all employees. It's not necessarily my role as superintendent only or Mrs. Chase as our chief financial officer. It's a responsibility of everyone in the school district to be fiscally responsible in terms of the actions that we take, decisions that we make, and how do we utilize resources in the most effective and efficient way. Again, I won't necessarily go through the three objectives, but there are three objectives that drive our fiscal responsibility goal as a school district. This document, in many ways, um, put into focus the, 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 as we go through the budget process, and viewing the budget process through an equity lens. Am I still sharing? Yes, you are. 
um, again, to, to ensure that, that as we look at options and opportunities for students, that we are truly uncovering and asking some critical questions. The first question is, what else do we need to do to ensure equity and outcomes? In other words, all students succeeding and realizing their full potential. Another question that we ask is, what else can we do to make the school and classroom experience more relevant for our students? That's the inclusive question. And then the third question is, how can we be more responsive to and capitalize on emerging, emerging changes and cultural shifts? So when we go through the budget process, it's a very deliberate process, it's a very disciplined process. It's a process that's driven by our mission as a school district in order to ensure that year after year, we have a budget that supports consistent opportunities and consistent outcomes for our students. This year is, um, as most people know, is a particularly challenging year in many ways um, for public education and Shen is no different. Consequently, as a part of this budget, we took a multi-pronged approach, which we typically do in the sense that we look at many, many options and scenarios in developing the budget. However, this, this year, there's a particular emphasis on how can we maintain the balance between program preservations. In other words, um, there is a point where investments, you start to realize diminishing uh, marginal returns to investment. Where is that point? And where is that point where you reduce programs so much that quite frankly with you, the investment in that particular program becomes insignificant or irrelevant or not impactful? That's juxtaposed against the reality that as a school system, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are avoiding structural deficits. In other words, the fiscal health of the school district is a primary responsibility as being stewards of the resources of the school district. And so those are the two things as we develop the budget that guides many of the, the decisions that we make. This year, we're taking a multi-year, multi-prong approach as noted here, recognizing that the first, the next two years, meaning the 2021 and 21 22 school years, we anticipate that we, will we have to continue strategically monitoring our expenditures to ensure that one, we're, we're operating within a reasonable cost footprint and addressing the various needs of our students, recognizing that some of those needs right now are still undefined based upon where we go with school reopening and the impact of COVID-19 as we move forward. The three years after that, um, is start to look at how do we start to right size um, and more um, assertively or intentionally address emerging needs. And also at the same time, how do we reserve a stabilization of our resources as a school district? So when you think about it, this budget is not only a budget proposal for the 2021 school year, it's a budget that speaks to our efforts and our actions over the course of the next five years. This particular chart puts the budget into, into context. One, anything that we look at and everything that we look in the budget comes from the perspective of value add. And when we talk about value add, we talk about academic capacity. What's the implication for class sizes? What's the implication for composition? Meaning the various needs of students within respective classes. Um, what are those implications? Equity supports, recognizing that we have to have specialized and targeted supports to meet the various needs of students. And academic rigor isn't necessarily about making hard classes harder. It's about how do we ensure that we engage in innovative practices? How do we ensure that we are geared up next generation standards? And certainly as we have pivoted over the last two and a half, three months to a much more e-learning environment, um, academic rigor has taken on a completely new meaning in terms of how do we prepare for a much more robust um, virtual um, virtual management system as a school district so we can pivot if necessary moving into the future cost effectiveness is always a driver within the budget process we are constantly constantly looking at opportunities to repurpose resources uh, recognizing again that we hire people to do the job so personnel management is a major part of what we do from what we how we recruit how we retain employees how we mentor employees professional development to ensure that employees are honing their respective skills to a collective bargaining process to ensure we support the various um, benefits and compensation of our employees to retain high quality employees as well as even transition and planning how do we ensure that when people leave the organization we don't have a dip in productivity as a result of people changing jobs or otherwise 
And the third um, component of that is always looking on the revenue and the tax implication side. Right now, Shenandoah um, achieves about 27, a little over 27 percent of revenue from state aid and a little over 70 percent of it from tax levy. And so we have to always be cognizant of the impact of the state budget because this impact of the state budget also impact tax levy um, as we move forward. Highlighted on this slide is something that we take tremendous pride in. Shenandoah, at least certain, I can speak for the last 15 years, this is the 15th budget putting together, we have been one of the, we have had, let me say it this way, we have had one of the lowest per pupil costs, not only in the region, across the state. And when you juxtapose that against the high quality program that we provide here at Shen, essentially our goal is to ensure that we're providing a high quality investment for our taxpayers. And when you look at the tax rate, this is just a three year average the true tax rate over the past three years has been negative, recognizing that of the six municipalities, and we largely look at the towns of Clifton Park and Half Moon, and that's not to discount the other four municipalities. However, those two towns capture about 80%, 90% of our student population or more. Um, so when we look at those, those population centers, we know that the tax rates in those two towns have been fluctuating at zero or, or, or reduced tax rates over the past three years. However, there are exceptions. The town of Boston is an exception to that because of some reevaluation that the town has underwent over the past seven, several years. And even with that the case, those tax growth has been, quite frankly, true, pretty minimal or fluctuating around one, one and a half percent over those years. And so again, we pride ourselves in being very cost effective in terms of how we use the resources um, granted to us, be it state resources or local resources. In putting this budget together, we really, really stepped back and say, okay, considering all the factors at play, we wanted to narrow the scope in terms of the things that we wanted to focus on. In other words, if we do these things well, we continue to thrive as a school district um, and one that quite frankly as a community has taken tremendous pride in and has supported over the years. So equity and outcomes is one of those areas when we talk about service following needs. Recognizing that coming off the next two months or three months, um, under this e-learn environment. While many kids have thrived, some kids have, 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 have had challenges. We also know there has been a different learning environment for our students. And so, so we always have to be cognizant about learning gaps. And how do we prepare to address some of those learning gaps moving forward into the 2021 school year, be it academic intervention supports, English as a new language, special education, or even on the other side of the coin, acceleration op options and opportunities for our students. We also know that as a school community, we have to continue to, to provide high quality options for all of our kids. And so articulation agreements with our local colleges have been a mainstay as a part of the Shen um, course of study. And this year we're pleased that we have two new courses coming on board. One of them particular now is, is very timely. Um, the health careers courses where we know we have seen that, that health workers are right now the most essential workers in our society. And so having a health careers um, course coming on board is very opportune and timely. We also have a financial literacy course coming on board, something that for years that we have contemplated and try to figure out the best way to do so. And again, having articulation agreements with our local colleges will help us support those things and also provide our students with college credits as they go through those courses. Mental health and wellness is going to be, it has always been a primary focus, but it's, I think it's going to be a heightened focus as we transition again through this COVID period and what I'm going to right now refer as a post-COVID period at some point in the future. Recognize that social emotional learning is going to be a big part of it. Restorative justice in terms of how do we ensure that students um, learn from whatever the situation is, how do we address ACEs, the, the adverse childhood experiences that our kids are having. And so how do we do those things in a very responsible way is the area of focus for this budget as well. And the last three areas of focus I wanna highlight with is technology. We clearly know, and it has been accentuated, or should I say even punctuated, um, in terms of the in integration of technology to support learning. And right now we're in the process of looking at our, our what we call a learning management system, the platform that we provide education to our students, the platforms that our educators use to correspond and teach students online. We're looking at those to ensure again that we have robust systems in place to support our needs moving forward. 
safety continues to be a major priority for the school district. Um, and certainly we still continue to focus on building the capacity to lock our buildings down um, to, to provide safe um, um, environments for our students in case of a crisis or emergency. So we're certainly looking at those kind of things. Even communication systems, upgrading our communication systems so we can much more effectively communicate within buildings, outside of buildings, and even with our larger community. And operation and maintenance, um, certainly one of those areas that we know that as a large system, we have to constantly focus on ensuring that our buildings are, are at peak performance. And even right now, we're in the process of looking at our HVAC system and thinking about how do those systems function, particularly as we transition to, to, to preparing for the transition of students and staff coming back to buildings. What's the HVAC uh, model under a COVID situation versus a pre-COVID situation? So we're in the process now of working with various contractors to answer some of those same questions that industries across the nation are dealing with. And we're looking at those things as well from an operation and maintenance perspective. So I share those things with you because oftentimes people think about the budget. They only think about the budget from a dollar and cents. We start the budget process from the identity, from the, the the recognition of our needs and how do we best address those various needs as a system in a very responsible way. So at this point, I'm going to ask um, Kathy Chase, who's our chief financial officer, to pick up and go through some of the numbers, so to speak, so people have an appreciation of the steps that we have taken to provide what we think is a very reasonable and responsible budget to the public. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. So one of the big areas that we often find uh, a savings for the district every year is what we call breakage. And that's the difference between retiring teachers going out on top step and new hire teachers coming in on lower steps. Uh, so you can see in this year, we have about 18 FTE that are retiring this year and we expect to save about $750,000. Uh, we also um, tried to right size through uh, restructuring as positions become vacant. Um, it gives us an opportunity to look at the situation differently. Do we need that position? Do we need it in the same way? Do we need three positions or do we need one position? Um, and we look at this across the board to see whether or not um, we can delay hiring, whether we need to rehire at all, and is that where we really need to put our resources at that point in time. So this year, as we were planning the budget, we saw opportunity to reduce, based on vacancies, 11.55 FTE, again, for around $750,000. We also have to contend with some mandated and contractual costs, as we've mentioned before. Um, health insurance is a big one. Um, most entities are seeing large increases. And I have to say, we joined the BOCES Prescription Consortium two years ago now, I think, and we are seeing a lot of savings in that regard. Um, and we're seeing good experience in our health insurance programs. So while our health insurance is going up about 4%, our drug costs are staying about 0% for an overall increase of just around 2%. But keep in mind, our total health insurance budget is about $26 million. Retirement and pension costs, those are set by the state, by the respective pension systems. TRS, which is the teacher's retirement system rate this year is an increase and what this means is 9.53% of salaries goes towards the retirement system as a cost to the district uh, for this next year, which we estimate to be about $6.9 million. Uh, for the non-instructional staff employees retirement system, we're expecting a 14.6% contribution rate uh, for all salaries, uh, non-instructional, and that will total about 4.5 million. And we also uh, have to contend with all of the contractual stipulations of all of our bargaining unit contracts. This year we had hoped to 
bargain um, and have a new contract for CSEA beginning July 1 of this year. Uh, given the situation that's gone on, we have reached an agreement to extend the contract one year so that we can spend the appropriate time negotiating uh, the contract for the coming years. Looking at some actual numbers, and I'll just kind of define the columns going across. We're starting with the 1920 adopted budget, which is the year that we're in currently. We add any of the operational ads and deducts, and by that I mean contractual stipulations, increases in some of our vendor contracts, all of those givens that if we did nothing, that's gonna be the cost um, for this next year. That gets us to the adjusted budget uh, for 2021. Then we have some net strategic ads and deducts, which includes a lot of the things that we just talked about, both myself and Dr. Robinson. And then we come up with our projected budget. And then you can also see the percent of percentage of the total budget as well. So uh, you can see operationally, just as example, instructional salaries are gonna go up $3 million this next year through our strategic ads and deducts. Again, some of the repurposing and the breakage we just spoke about, um, we were able to uh, show a deduction of over a million dollars, um, which brings us to the total instructional budget of 64.4 million. Uh, administrative salaries, same thing. You'll see that's about 3.28% of the budget. Non-instructional, uh, same thing. Um, we do have some reductions in the non-instructional area. In fact, we decided to eliminate two positions that were vacant and recreate one that will actually provide us more capacity uh, to oversee crews in the evening. So, uh, so that takes care of all of our salaries. You can see that's well over 50%. Um, and with our benefits included, that will ultimately total about 85% of our total budget. On the equipment line, basically, basically here we reallocated uh, some equipment monies from the Future Ready grants to classroom facelifts this next year. Uh, so while it looks like we're reducing equipment, we're actually uh, reclassifying in another line. Contractual and other uh, costs, you'll see went up somewhat. A lot of this is for those security upgrades that we just spoke about, um, professional development for alternative scheduling, some of the PD for health and wellness, as well as next generation standards. Uh, textbooks. Um, that tends to be a very uh, stable amount. Um, it's based on a per pupil uh, cost and we get X amount of dollars per pupil. So that stays relatively flat and we try to maximize that uh, state aid as much as possible. OCs, also another expenditure driven kind of aid, but this is the expenditure line. Uh, we are showing some increases there. Um, Things like CTE tuitions, uh, career and technical education, um, and um, I guess that's truly the main driver there. And um, going further into supplies, uh, I would say standardly across the board, probably as much or more so in operations and maintenance, as they've been doing a lot of work throughout the district and getting some, some mini projects done. Benefits, uh, as we spoke about, um, about a 2% increase in health insurance. The other large item is teacher's retirement system. We have about a $600,000 increase there. Um, so that accounts for 26% of the budget. Transfer to other funds. Um, this includes our debt service payments, which is, um, we kind of describe it as a mortgage payment. We're actually seeing a decrease this year um, of about $500,000, a little bit of offset with um, our school uh, food service fund where we now have to cover the bad debt expense. As we go to the projected expenditure summary, our prior budget, again, 177 million. 
Operational net additions is 4.1 or about 2.31%. The strategic net reductions, uh, 186,000 is a negative 0.1, which brings us to our proposed budget increase of 2.21%, um, about a $3.9 million increase. The next slide shows our three-part budget, and I apologize, I neglected to put the percentages there, um, but you can see for each of the last two years, as well as this year, almost identical bar graphs, and that's because the administrative, the program, and the capital pieces of the budget stay relatively stable from year to year. Our, as you would expect, the largest piece is instructional at 77.34%, Administrative is 9.26, capital is 13.41. As we look at the five-year budget trend, again, you can see very stable, very flat. Uh, it's usually within that 2.1 or 2.2% range. Um, I was actually shocked when we ended up with 2.19 two years in a row. That was not deliberate, but, um, but very stable across the years. As we look at the state aid, um, as you know, we had hoped to get some updated state aid uh, numbers from the governor, which we did not after they did the look back period in <clears throat> April. So we are taking the uh, proposed state aid that was received um, on April 1st from the governor at that point in time. State aid, uh, you can see foundation aid increased very little, which that's generally the area that we expect to see an increase each year. In fact, if the foundation aid formula was driving this number, we would see a much larger increase uh, as that has not run in several years now. Um, the other aids that you see listed here, there's some increases and decreases. However, those are what we call expenditure driven aids. So the more we spend, the more aid we get. Um, sometimes it's a percentage of the cost. Sometimes it's a dollar amount per item per student. Um, but you can see, um, you know, that those are always going to vary somewhat. Um, the pandemic adjustment is new this year, as is the pandemic restoration. So the pandemic adjustment actually reduces our state aid by 393,000 and the pandemic restoration, which came from the federal government, uh, uh, basically offset that to zero. So in total, our state aid is increasing about $249,000 this year. Uh, looking at the projected revenues, as we just um, talked about, um, the state aid you can see is at 26.55% down at the bottom of the slide. The other real big um, factor in our revenue is property taxes. And that's a 70.64% uh, of our budget. And this year it's a 2.6% increase. Um, slipping down to the next slide, um, we have miscellaneous items, interest, and then the other large, if you can call it large, is the appropriated fund balance, which includes both general fund fund balance and reserves for retirement and employment benefit reserve. So the three major factors in our revenue are property taxes, state aid, and appropriated fund balance. Everything else totals 1.21% of our budget. So clearly property taxes and state aid are the main factors that drive our budget. Looking at the summary, the budget is going up 2.21% as we had said. Uh, property taxes, if we look at the tax cap, our tax cap this year is 3.04%. Our proposed budget driven taxes are 2.6% which means we basically had $548,000. Uh, we ended up below the tax cap by $548,000. Last year, you can see we actually were 1.7 million below the tax cap. And that's a fairly consistent model for us uh, that we always uh, leave some room there for the tax cap. 
and the projected impact on taxpayers. Um, and this assumes one that we we took a five year average of our taxable assessed values, which is 2.53%. Um, we used the existing equalization rates because we don't know what the new ones are going to be. And based on that information, we projected that our taxes are going to increase less than one tenth of a percent. Um, that could be different when we get the actual information on, in July, um, but our best guess, if we looked at trends, that is what it looks like. And we truly feel that we'll have basically a 0% increase. I think the effect on a home of $250,000 uh, full value is $5 of an increase this next year. So thank you, Mrs. Chase. Um, just to finish the budget piece up, and then if there are questions that that have come came in to Mrs. to the public information officer, I have her read those questions, and we could try to address them if they're related to the budget. But um, four things I just want to point out that again, as we develop the budget, we have certain objectives in mind. Um, one, objective one is to preserve quality programs. We're in the business of providing a quality educational experience for, for our students and supporting our um, leaders for learning in doing so. And we recognize that, that this budget, um, while it does so, it will be a tight budget moving forward. Um, there will be areas that we have to look at very closely. There are unknown costs related to transitioning back to school that we have to anticipate and may potentially reallocate resources accordingly. So we know that those contingencies exist. The second piece of this as well is recognizing the economic times and trying to have a budget again that has minimal or no impact on our taxpayers in terms of increases in taxes. Um, and as Mrs. Chase mentioned, um, we're waiting for final equalization rates, which typically don't um, are not provided to the school district until August, and that goes into the calculation of the tax bills for September. So, however, um, our track record is one, and if, again, looking back at the, the last several years, we have seen very minimal impact or increases in the tax bills over the past several years. And we anticipate that should be the case as well moving forward. The third objective is recognizing that right now, there's still a looming uncertainty about the status of New York State's um, capacity to support schools. And so subsequently, we have to build a budget with certain levers to address any potential um, or anticipated reductions in state aid. Um, and we have two levers that we're potentially looking to do so. One is if we have to further reduce our debt service. Um, and again, back to Mrs. Chase and her team working with our financial advisors, trying to ensure that we try to refinance debt as much as we can to realize the lowest interest rate, subsequently lower the principal amounts that we're paying. A second piece of it is looking at our fund balance capacity. And as we look to wrap up this school year, we're going to basically see what savings that we have at the end of this year and how those things could potentially translate to an opportunity to offset any reduction in state aid that might be announced by the, the governor at the, at the next lookup period, which we're hearing could be June, mid-June, or following that could be a July and or even one in October. Clearly, those periods are troublesome for the school district because it's essentially after we have started our process and to, to contend with mid-year reductions in programs, it's not only disruptive in terms of the quality of programs, but we have to have levers in place to ensure consistency in programs for our students. So we come from this from not necessarily the native perspective, but in terms of how do we ensure the things that we want for our students and, and in terms of also the expectation that this community has for the school district as being one that provide a quality experience for all our students in a quality workplace for our employees. And the fourth piece of it is that we recognize that and we're fortunate because certainly as you look around and you read a newspaper on a daily basis, you see many places making massive reductions. And we take pride and we have taken pride over the past decade um, to ensure that as a school district that we remain fiscally healthy. And, and as I pointed out before, not fiscally healthy doesn't necessarily mean spending the most because to the contrary, we have one of the lowest per pupil, pupil costs across the entire state and yet um, we provide some of the best programming across the entire state. So fiscal healthy 
is, is trying to balance all those type things and recognizing that the ripple effects, the fiscal um, effects can actually be for the next several years, as I pointed out before. So we're taking that very multi-year perspective as we develop this budget. And the last slide before I ask if there were any questions that came in through the BOE address is remind people that there are four propositions on the June 9th vote. The first proposition, number one, is a proposed budget of 181 um, 657 429 The second proposition is the bus and maintenance purchase. We have a very um, aggressive and very um, intentional bus replacement cycle. To put, put things in perspective, we have about 208 buses that's on the road at any given time, um, traveling over, um, I think, over a little bit, almost 2 million miles, transporting between in-district, out-of-district, private placements, about 13,000 students. So it's a major, major operation in terms of transporting of students. And, and so certainly bus replacement is a, is a significant portion of that. And we've been very consistent with this practice over the years to ensure that our fleet is always at a high rate of passage in terms of DOT pass rates of our inspections. And we take tremendous pride on the leadership of Al Karam in doing so. And then the third proposition is the Board of Education seats. We have two seats, three-year terms, um, two incumbents, um, Mrs. Hoffman and, and Mrs. Miller are running again. And we also have um, three, I'm sorry, five other individuals running for the Board of Education as well. And I've asked Mrs. Deficiani if we actually had that information prepared. We're in the process of putting a bio together of those candidates um, so we can have those candidates ready. But if not, we will certainly post that bio on the website um, in short order so the public is aware of the candidates that's running for the Board of Education. But for purposes of tonight, um, I'll just say the names. Um, we have Mr. Daryl Gianetti, um, Mrs. Jennifer Gleason, Mrs. Lacey Griffin Broth, Mrs. Naomi Hoffman, Mr. Brian Kissel, Mrs. Gusta Miller, and Mr. Thomas Templeton. Again, we have two incumbents running and five others um, running in competition for the two seats on the Board of Education. So at this point, I will pause and stop sharing and go back to the screen and turn it over to Mr. Presley to see if there are any questions um, from our public information officer that we need to address. Okay. Uh, right now, I, I don't see any questions that have come in. I have received an email, I think, last week from uh, women in the community that would more to share their perspective. I think Mrs. Deficiana may have received any question. Yeah, okay. we have five questions. Okay, let's go um, with those. And, and I just wanted to comment on, the, I'm just waiting to hear back from two board candidates on their bios. Hopefully I can get it posted tomorrow. Okay, so the first question comes from Francois Paget of 11 Carpenter Way, Clifton Park, New York. He says, dear uh, members of the board, questions on the budget proposal for 2021. I am very concerned with the program for students with disabilities, account number 2250 in the budget. <clears throat> in 2019-20 in budget, that account was increased by a meager one third of 1% compared to the prior year. Students with disabilities have seen the impact with a reduction in services, especially in the transition from middle school to high school. For example, a student with a disability impacting the, learn, uh, the ability to learn spelling was not, will not be taught, tested, or graded in spelling, not even once per quarter. This is disturbing from an academic standpoint and is probably not even meeting the minimum required by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act IDEA. My question for the board, what is the percentage increase in the budget for the program for students with disabilities in the 2020-21 budget proposal? Will the budget be sufficient to provide the needed services? Thank you for your work in these challenging times. Mr. Presser, do you want me to address that question? Please do so. Uh, so the, the answer is yes. Um, we actually spent a lot of time looking at special education services. Um, special education services are driven by IEP determinations. And this spring, while we were in an e-learning environment, the CSC process was very, very vigorous. 
online process, hundreds of CSC meetings um, took place to ensure, again, that we are addressing the various needs of, of students with um, disabilities. Another piece that's not factored into the equation, too, is federal funding on the IDEA that we receive for special education program. And so this budget is general fund funds and not necessarily IDEA funds as well. So, so there's a significant portion of the budget that supports special education that's coming from federal IDEA dollars as well. Um, so when we look at the budget, as we noted before, one of our primary tenets is service follow needs. And we recognize that it's our obligation to meet the needs of all students, in particular obligation to meet the IEP needs of students. Um, as a portion of that question was asked, it was more of a service um, delivery question. And at some point, um, I would certainly ask Mrs. Smila to have a follow-up if necessary with the parent or, or the, the person who submitted that question in terms of the program piece. But from a budgetary piece, I would absolutely say with confidence that we address the needs. In fact, quite frankly, with you, one of the things Shen has a reputation for is, in fact, providing quality program where we actually have people move into the district for the programs that we offer our students. And we have some unique programs in the district that's not offered any place at all um, locally. So, so we take tremendous pride in trying to address the needs of our students, recognizing that, that there could be differences of opinions or even differences in approaches in how those needs are met. But from a budgetary perspective, very confident that we can meet the needs of our students. Next question, Kelly. Okay, this one's from Nicholas Baldessaro. Um, and it says, thank you very much. I know this is a new format that we're all learning how to use. Here is my question. In slide number 21, projected revenues, there appears to be an increase of 100,000, no, I'm sorry, an increase of 1 million on the line appropriated fund balance. Is this amount coming from the unreserved, undesignated account in the fund balance or some other place? I believe that the U, U slash U account was about 7 million at this time last year. Thanks. Mrs. Chase, do you want to address that, um, that line? Yes, as I'm looking at the uh, PowerPoint, I am seeing that there is a uh, math error there. Um, in total, our increase is 3.9 million. The bulk of that comes from real property taxes of uh, 3.2 million. State aid increases 2.49 um, and 400,000 in interest. So the 1 million you see increasing appropriated fund balance is uh, not correct. So the so, total is correct, but the numbers didn't change from one to the next. Correct. That's correct, the bottom line total. Correct. And he also asked, is that amount coming from unreserved, undesignated account? So to, to address that question, the state of New York um, allows school district to carry over what they call 4% unappropriated fund balance. Um, for years, Shen has been below that 4%. Um, and we look at that very carefully in terms of um, how much we contribute to the general fund as well as how much we contribute to various reserves. And this is a perfect example of one. Several years ago, the state of New York allowed the establishment of a TRS reserve, teacher retirement reserve. And as, as a district, um, we slowly started contributing to that reserve. And it's ideal because we anticipate some of those costs, not only for the coming year, but for the future years, because of the stock market impact, could see a significant increase. And what we don't want to have as a situation is that we're cutting programming services for our students because we have to pay for um, external or mandated increases as a result of, again, be it this case, market fluctuations. So we monitor reserves very carefully. At the end of the year, we will do so. A presentation goes to the board after the audited, after the audited, um, um, the school budget is audited by auditors, and that presentation goes to the board. And at that point, 
we make decisions about reappropriation of any fund balances. So as a part of this whole budget process, yes, we look at the fund balance as almost uh, as a lever to, to one, mitigate taxes, two, to provide the district opportunities to address uncertainties, such as what we're dealing with right now, as well as the huge looming uncertainty of the potential reduction in state aid um, in the future coming weeks and months as well. But still, our, we have an obligation to remain at or below that 4% unappropriated fund balance amount, which we will. Okay, the next one is from Daryl Gianetti. And it says, comment on the proposed budget for public hearing tonight, May 26. The Shen District has done an outstanding financial job over the past several years since the last fiscal crisis. Our reserves, both restricted and unreserved, <clears throat> have grown due to excellent budget control. Saving our tax dollars is very important in providing financial stability. We have accomplished this and at the same time provided an excellent education for our students. This year's budget, like those in the past, should be passed. I believe the taxpayers should approve and I support a yes vote. However, this current budget, which is already at the printer and on the ballots, should have done more to help the taxpayer. Our current economic crisis has hit every taxpayer. Due to our strong financial position, I believe more of our savings from the fund balance should have been used to mitigate the tax increase. Daryl Gianetti. And, and Mr. Presser, do you mind address? I'll address that again. Uh, one of the, th the tricky things that we have with this budget, in past years, our school budgets were based upon a, an approved state budget. Yes, the state of New York approved a budget on 4-1. However, that approval came with the notion that the state will have four look back periods that spread out over several months, therefore placing the district in a very precarious position. And the last thing that we want to do is to say to the taxpayers, this is a budget, this is a potential tax impact. Two, three months down the road, we hear a significant downturn in state support. And then we're saying to the taxpayers, oh, sorry, we have to increase taxes even more. One of the things that Shen has done is quite frankly to make the tax implication very predictable for taxpayers. And if you look back on the chart that Mrs. Chase pointed out, even the budget increases have fluctuated right around 2%. And that has also then led to a very predictable tax impact to the point where quite frankly, people could budget for it and almost bank on their taxes being a certain thing. That's unheard of in most school districts. And so we do recognize the economic times and a part of the responsibility we also have is how do we avoid a situation two, three, four months down the road when we hear about the potential impact or lack thereof of state aid of not adding an undue, unexpected burden to our taxpayers. And so that's that delicate balance that we have. And so once those become known, again, we continue in that same multi-year planning sequence as we pointed out before, because we do believe that this will be a multi-year fiscal stress, not only on our residents, but also on our system. And a part of our obligation is to balance both quality service provisions while yet having a minimal impact on our taxpayers. And, and certainly this budget attempts to do so, but I have to tell you, the big looming question mark is, what will happen with federal stimulus funds come to New York State? then what will happen to those funds if or when they come to New York State in terms of the potential impact on schools? If we hear good news, that good news will be shared with our taxpayers. That means our tax levy would actually go down. Um, in other words, so if we hear additional state aid, we will balance that to ensure that we are again um, spreading that in a way that's re responsible in terms of tax implication, as well as ensuring the fiscal health of the school district moving forward. Okay, Mr. the Brett. next one. Well, I'd, I'd like to make some comments. I, I, I think, uh, Dr. Robinson, you were very clear to us when this started three months ago about the importance of programs and people. And when we talk to uh, members of the community, they don't want to lose their teachers. They don't want to have programs consolidated or, or going away uh, for their kids, for their students. That adds a lot of value to, to our programs. And, and by not having this fund balance available, 
we run the risk of losing those programs. And I, I look at it as a straight drop in programs if we don't have these uh, these ready to go for the, for the look back period. So that's what I think is the, the, the way I see it is that you've got to keep our programs and people. Thank you. Mrs. DeFisani. Okay, the next one is from Daniel Mathias from Boston Lake, New York. It says, hello, I have a question for tonight's budget hearing. In each of the past five years, the Shen District has ended their fiscal years with a surplus due to excellent fiscal control. What is the expectation for the amount of dollars that will be added to the fund balance when the school year ends on June 30th, 2020? Um, I, thank you I, for your consideration. Again, thank you very much for, for that question. And um, even though we addressed it in a previous um, question, I'll address it again. Um, the first constraint is the 4% limitation that we have as a school district. Um, we certainly look to do that. The second piece of it, we'll also look at what reserves we need to shore up. And just to give an example of one, um, tax tertiary claims is, is a constant piece for the school district. For people who don't understand what tax tertiary claims are, I often say if you ride down Route 9 and 146, most of those businesses on an annual basis um, file to get their tax um, um, levies assessments reduced um, over the years. And quite frankly, too, we anticipate that we're going to see some of that as a result of, of lower sales volume in some of those businesses. And so again, as a as as Shen as a school system, and I just want to emphasize this point. Oftentimes, people think of Shen only as a place that provides educational resources for us for our students. But we're a business. We have to ensure that we manage resources in such a way that we anticipate potential liabilities. We manage resources in such a way that we we anticipate potential pinpoint and pinch points in our revenues. So that not only it's not about just being viable, it's about ensuring, as Mr. Preston just alluded to, that year after year we provide a consistent quality experience for our students. And so, so we have to anticipate those type things as we move forward. And so as we get to the end of the year, we not only look at our fund balance capacity, but also look at things such as where, we, where do we anticipate seeing increases in tax tertiary reserves? Where do we anticipate seeing increases in pension costs in future years? So again, we avoid spikes in the tax rate to our taxpayers so that our tax impact is very predictable from year to year. And so, so the fund balance becomes a tremendous tool, if you will, for us to not only um, mitigate potential cost increases, but also, quite frankly, to create a very predictable um, tax levy implication for our voters. And I think that's very important. As And personally, as someone who lives in this community, I know that the ability to be able to budget and plan for what you may pay is a significant thing because oftentimes your tax bill is the single largest bill that you get and but when you put in the larger scheme of things, it's not the largest bill that you pay over the course of the year, but it's the largest single bill that you get. And so people need to be able to plan for that because we have many people do tax um, um, tertiary accounts and have it as a part of their mortgage payments. And so predictability is a major part of that as well. Was it all, Mrs. Diffishani? Nope. There's two more. Okay, um, Bob Brondi from Boston Lake writes, can you explain in terms of real dollars the statement in slide 25, expenditure lever, lever debt service in slide 25 point number three could contribute to deal with the anticipated reduction in state aid. Is some modification or reduction of spending on debt or debt reserve planned? But the answer is yes. Um, potential. So we spent about uh, right now about ten million dollars on debt service, and we're in the process now of looking at because our debt service um, schedule of, is actually decreases on a decline, and so we anticipate that if we budget less for 2021, or right now it's it's being reduced almost by half million dollars. And if we're compelled because of, of reduced state aid, in other words, if we get less revenue, we have to either do one of two things, increase our revenue through some other sources and or reduce our expenditure on the other side to match with our revenue to create a balanced budget equation. And so the debt service is one of those areas because, again, um, as it, and this has nothing to do with the COVID situation. They're just out of our practice over the years to ensure that, quite frankly, we're getting the best interest rates on our borrowing 
And a lot of that also comes because the school district has a great quote unquote credit rating. So we do get great interest rates because of our fiscal responsible um, approach to, to budgeting. So, so we're looking at that as one of those areas that if we have to squeeze for a year, we know that 2021, 2022 should be slightly, which should be lower than that. So it creates an opportunity for us to squeeze and not having to worry about backfilling in those future years, which is essentially a structural deficit that we'd create for ourselves on that side of it. On the fund balance side, as I mentioned before, as we get to the end of the school year, as, as, as we complete the audit process in August, we have a better handle in terms of what's our fund balance capacity. And that also creates a potential, again, of if we have to infuse revenue on the other side because of a loss of state aid, the potential of doing so. So while we don't have a single number right now, we know we have the capacity for about a half million dollars either way um, to address what we think those anticipated shortfalls will be as we move forward. Mrs. Okay. Diffusiani? Okay, we've got um, one more. This one's from Emily Burkhardt, a reporter from Channel 13. When do you expect to hear an update from the state on how much aid they will be able to provide for the upcoming year? Could this budget be amended if state aid is cut? If so, how would that process work and on what timelines? What uncertainty? certainties regarding the new normal and reopening after the pandemic are creating difficulties in planning for the next five years? So that's a, that's a great television interview question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so for the purpose of, of our friends in, 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 in television and also for our listening audience, uh, there, there are a couple, a few things actually embedded in that question. Um, the first one, I'm gonna go to the last one first is that there are many uncertainties that we're thinking about that we have to plan for. Um, uncertainties in terms of um, purchasing of, of, of PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, uncertainties in terms of, of what's the implication if we have to go to a hybrid model of school and what's the staffing implications of those type things. So there are many, many uncertainties that, that right now um, we have contingencies in the sense that we know that if we have to pivot and use resources differently, we can. So, but those are significant unknowns. The first two parts of the question in terms of if something different happens with the state, the budget, the expenditure, the Board of Education and the public vote on an expenditure budget. Yes, we put the revenue side of the equation so people have confidence to know that we have the revenues to, to, to cover the expenditure costs. However, once the expenditure budget is approved by the voters, that is the expenditure budget. And so consequently, that's the reason why we try to have those levers in place so that if we are compelled to, to expend less than $181 million that Mrs. Chase just outlined, do we then say, do we squeeze our debt service expenditure line more so that we're not spending as much and or after we get to through the end of the school year and start looking at potential added fund balance capacity, do we infuse additional revenues? The board can do that through board authority. But the expenditure budget is the expenditure budget. Once the voters act on the $181.6 million budget, that's our expenditure limit. The question becomes how much of that will we be able to expend based upon the revenue? And subsequently, that's the reason why we try to present a balanced budget. So we know that if we have a dollar to spend, we have a dollar in the account to cover the cost. Um, and certainly it's not a situation where unfortunately, um, sometimes people build budgets to expend more than, than they have in revenue. We build a budget that's based upon a balanced sequence clearly recognizing that this year is a different year than any other years in the past, even years when we had significant financial downturn. Even in those years, we knew where the big holes were. And so therefore we were able to build bridges to cross over some of those big pitfalls. This year is still a very much an uncertainty to us as we sit here on, on the 26th of May. And quite frankly, it could very well still be the same uncertainty on June 9th when voters go and vote on an expenditure budget as well. And that's it. Uh, Mrs. DeFriciano, Mr. Presser, I'll turn this back over to you, sir. Uh, I, I did get one of the forms a week ago by, by a different person. Does anybody object if I read these? 
it, it's it's more of a sharing of perspective. So uh, this came to us from uh, Mr. Peter Shermerhorn, uh, 15 Swan Drive, Rexford, New York. And his comments are, I strongly believe in supporting teachers, our schools, and education. I always vote in favor of the school budget. My question is simple. With many companies, institutions, and individuals either out of work or on reduced salary benefits due to COVID-19, what is being done to address the state pension obligation? Tier 1 NYS pensioners who retired at 55 to 60 are continuing to draw the equivalent of close to full salary at time of retirement in this time of severe fiscal stress. Uh, the New York State teacher pension calculation formula is still uh, pension factor times age factor of applicable times final average salary equals the minimum annual pension. For tier one pensioners, pension factor equals the sum of 1.8% per year of credit for NYS service before 1959 and B, 2% per year for NYS service after 1959. Excuse me, the first 1.8% was before 1959. Maximum uh, pension age factor is 79%, meaning teachers in tier one eligibility have the, ability to be, have the ability to be paid close to their final salary for the rest of their life, and most retired just over midlife. I get that pensions were created to compete with the private sector, and the many teachers make less than private employee counterparts. But even as, as nice it has revived their retirement plan tier structure to more amenable levels for current teachers, it seems that retirees on tier one need to bear a burden of this crisis just as younger generations are, if we are all truly in this together. As a taxpayer with many critical state services for people today at risk today, for many impacted by COVID-19 and severe crises ongoing and looming with the opiate crisis and mental health needs, I have concern about continuing to fund education at current levels without this large liability. Those are the comments from Mr. Peter Schirmerhorn. I, I think, Dr. Robinson, uh, your thoughts. I, I believe you do work with the TRS group. So, so just to clarify, um, I'm on the TRS board. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> just want to clarify the word work. Yep. Um, so, so one of the things that the TRS board is same thing with the ERS um, as well, recognizing that the pension systems um, is something, and we have seen when pension systems are mismanaged. You see the nurses at St. Clair Hospital in Schenectady is struggling now to, to recoup benefits that were committed to um, employees. And so we, we do recognize the tremendous benefit for the pension system. We also know, however, though, that um, the large majority of the funding that support the payment of pensioners is actually from investments, not necessarily contributions made by local school districts. Yes, while it's a notable amount, the large majority of the pension comes from investments. Consequently, that's why as we look at the global marketplace and anticipate that there's a lag effect between when there's a market downturn and when those things impact rates, we anticipate that that impact will be a year out in 2021, um, 22 budget. And subsequently, that's the reason why I noted off the reserves so that we're not shifting a significant burden suddenly to local taxpayers versus trying to budget and plan for those, those things moving forward. The second piece to that is too, uh, yes, the, the pension system has changed significantly over the years in terms of the contribution rates for tier one. And in fact, I, I, I think it's a very small handful of people who are tier one eligible that are still working. Um, the large portion of our employee base are tier four, and now we're seeing a significant more of new employees coming to tier six, and those rate structures are significantly different um, over the years. And so, so, so clearly while we watch those things as a, as a school system, Shenandoah very care, um, carefully, and that's the reason why I mentioned before that we have to take a multi-year perspective when we think about our budget, because those are some external cost factors that we have to keep our eyes on in terms of how those things come into play and how we trigger those things moving forward as well. And, and pension in New York is always a political hot potato. However, it's one that New York State and certainly the TRS board um, takes tremendous pride in funding those systems so pensioners could have a high degree of confidence that they're not into their retirement years and all of a sudden someone's saying that we can't afford your pension, which is a, is a major concern for many, many people. Um, as well. So it's, it's that fine balancing act between preserving a quality life for people who committed um, 30, 40, 50 years of their life in a profession, as well as ensuring that as a system 
that we anticipate where some of those cost adjustments might occur and plan for those, be it through reserves or otherwise. Thank you. So, and Mr. Preston, if um, with your um, permission, we could transition out of the budget here and I could go to the pull up the board agenda and you could commence with the meeting. Okay. Are there any other questions that anybody is aware of or go further? I see no other questions. So let's go to uh, the meeting agenda. So I'll um, present that screen for you, Mr. Preston. The first item is to adopt agenda. So the first portion of the meeting was the uh, public hearing on the budget. Now we go to adopting an agenda. Can I get a motion? To adopt. Motion. Uh, Mrs. Rajat, first motion. Anybody second. for second motion? Can you know me for second? Uh, Ms. Hoffman for the second motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Do we have any nays? Ayes have it. So uh, at this point, uh, I believe we've already talked about uh, the, the standard uh, messages earlier, uh, standard comments, uh, and, and you can read about them if you're looking at the agenda. So we'll turn it over to the superintendent's comments. Go ahead, Dr. Robertson. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Presser. I'm actually going to stop sharing right now, and I'm going to ask Mr. McDermott to prepare. The first presentation is by Mr. Rosella. It's a video. And so I'm going to stop sharing and ask um, Mr. McDermott to pick that up and share that video with the board. The Shenandoah Art Department is pleased to share this presentation highlighting student achievements and work during the 2019-2020 school year. Yeah, there's no Each volume. Our students participate in a number of shows. Um, Ken, there's no volume. This year's Empire State Plaza show features K-8 work from a variety of local schools. All exhibited work must be Mr. McDermott, no volume. by the Plaza's collection. It's very low, so if people can turn up their volumes. Can you hear it, Mrs. Rajat? Yeah, the, the audio is low. Um, as suggested, the best option is to turn up your volume on your computer. Um, there's nothing we can do on this end, I apologize. Okay, so if everyone could do that, continue to paint that, Mr. McNamara. Presentation highlighting student achievements and work during the 2019-2020 school year. Each year, our students participate in a number of shows throughout the Capital Region. This year's Empire State Plaza show features K-8 work from a variety of local schools. All exhibited work must be based on or influenced by the Plaza's collection of modern art. This requirement allows teachers to generate creative lessons on contemporary artists. In fact, several of our team members offered professional development courses on this subject at local, regional, and state levels. This year, the show, like several others, was interrupted by the closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But despite that, Shenandoah proudly exhibited 191 student works in this show. In January, Shen High School students participated in the Saratoga All-Stars exhibit hosted by the Saratoga Art Center. This show features work from students in grades 9 through 12 from various school systems in Saratoga County. Each participating teacher selects three high-quality works to showcase student talent. In total, 30 Shenandoah students were represented. The Arts and Three Dimension exhibit is sponsored by the Capital Area Art Supervisors Group, also known as CAS. This exhibit is juried by a group of professional artists. After reviewing well over 200 selections from component school districts, approximately 80 works were chosen for display, four of those from Shenandoah students. Congratulations to our students on their effort and their achievement. An extra special congratulations should be extended to Mrs. Rachel Garrison. Mrs. Garrison is our high school ceramics teacher and is retiring this year. We thank her for her service and for her tremendous contribution to the Shen team over many successful years. CAS also sponsors a media show each year which features digital artwork, photography, and film. Participating teachers select work they deem high quality in this media. Amongst the 25 Shenandoah entries, four were selected for commendation. Among the most prestigious shows in our community is the High School Regional Show. This event represents a collection of the finest works from the Capital Region, all of which are selected after a jurying process. This year, Shenandoah is proud to recognize four students whose work was selected for this show. 
there is no doubt that this school year has presented challenges. Despite those challenges, Shenandoah art teachers and students continue to thrive. The power of the arts is strong in good times and resonates more profoundly in times of crisis. Creativity remains an important outlet for students, and there is no better avenue for that expression than the arts. The following represents a collection of work that students have been inspired to complete during this period of virtual instruction. The Shenandoah Art Department is positioned for continued success regardless of the circumstances we face. The entire team of proud and talented educators is solely focused on keeping our students as engaged as possible, and will continue to support learning and creativity. Thank you for your attention thus far. The remaining slides in this presentation will scroll and will feature a very small sampling of work from each teacher in our district and will conclude in approximately three minutes. Music is courtesy of the Shenandoah High School Band Program and Mr. Carucci. Thank you, Mr. McDermott. Um, Mr. Roselli, do you want to offer any comments before we transition? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to you, to Dr. Wood, uh, and to the Board of Ed and the entire community for the continued support of the arts. Uh, it was unfortunate we were not able to have our regular end of the year art show, which is always a, a great exhibit. Um, but hopefully that slideshow gave you a little taste of what happened during the year. Uh, and you could see that uh, despite the challenges before us, uh, kids are still making art in our community, and that's a great thing. And uh, we'll be ready for next year, whatever it looks like. So thank you, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And congratulations to all the kids who uh, won some awards. It was great. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Mr. Press, want me to continue with the presentations? Yes, please continue. Um, so our next one is actually just um, Ms. Carmen. We don't have a presentation. Mrs. Carmen, come on board talk about our character education recognition um, as well, and then uh, transition to the counseling presentation, um, which Mrs. Carmen and Mrs. Drago would lead, and we have several of our counselors from our CAC um, as a part of that as well. So Mrs. Carmen. 
Good evening, thank you very much. Tonight I am presenting, um, we have two recipients for the Character Education Award. The first recipient is a student at the high school, Andre Kreitz. Um, Andre has been a student in the community-based work program for three years. He is a paid employee of uh, Perger Green Senior Living, and he is a paid custodian at Child Time in Clifton Park. His schedule is packed with school and work. However, every week, Andre plans his schedule around the Bountiful Backpack program. He has been an intern for the program for a few years now. He gives up all free time to be there when a shipment arrives to help Tracy with cleaning and disinfecting and to be the cog of the delivery system on Thursdays. He is known as the puzzle master when he packs volunteers trunks on Thursdays. He's able to fit the entire school's bounty into a Prius. If he is absent on a Thursday, volunteers ask, where is he? he they miss him desperately. Andres exits Shenandoah's this year, and he has already asked how he can give to this program in his adult life. He is a true asset, and we will truly miss him next year. And Andre is on the line with us right now with his family. So if we could just. Mr. Press, you want to offer some comments to Andres? A a absolutely. I, I was amazed to hear about all the things uh, Andre has done, and I hope his, his family got to hear that as well. I mean, you've made a big difference in probably one of the most important programs we have because of the number of people that uh, are impacted positively by Bountiful Backpack. You really understood that it was important and you spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. You want to continue doing this after you leave Shen. So you're setting a great example for everybody. Thank you very much, Andre and family. Thank you. Um, we do have another student that we are recognizing, but we're going to hold off on that one. Unfortunately, um, they are sick. Um, so our last recipient who is also on with us right now is Liz Gleason. Liz Gleason is a recipient of the Character Education Award as well. She is a team player who goes above and beyond with her students. Liz creates a supportive, caring, and nurturing environment to ensure academic success for her students. Aside from being an extremely hardworking educator, Liz Gleason is a leader in our community. She leads a service organization at Scano Elementary called ECHO. Everyone can help others. She leads a service organization at Scano, I'm sorry, excuse me. Many have all benefited from her caring and compassionate example. She has shown the kids how to support one another and their community. She is always encouraging and leading with her heart. Her club was so popular that she had to extend her hours to make it fair and provide the opportunity for all kids who are looking to participate. She inspires everyone of those kids to be kind, compassionate and go the extra mile to recognize the people in their own community as well as their needs. Her optimism and ambitious nature inspires all those around her to make the school and community a better place. For the past several years, her Echo Club students have made posters for annual Red Cross blood drives, collected and organized countless boxes of food for the needy, engaged Scano students and staff in spirit weeks and so much more. Liz also organizes a therapy dog program that creates a no judgment zone for struggling readers. What doesn't Liz do? She's such an asset to our district. In choosing Elizabeth for this award, you are choosing a woman who not only displays the very best in character, but teaches it and passes it on to her students and the ripples of her actions pass through the families and the community. She's truly an outstanding member of our community. Mr. Presley. Hey, I just want to say thank you very much for everything you're doing at Scano with the uh, ECHO organization. Uh, it, it says a lot and you're just making a positive difference that as somebody says, ripples through the community. And so thank you very much for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Carmen. Um, just to continue um, with Mrs. Carmen, I'm going to share my screen and pull up the counseling presentation. So Mrs. Carmen, if you'd be prepared. While Dr. Robinson is pulling that up, I also want to make note that uh, Ron Agustinoni, the principal of the high school, is presenting 
with myself, Kathleen Drago, and we have a few counselors uh, represented from each level here tonight. We wanna thank the Board of Education, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Wood for having us here tonight. Um, we each year present to the Board of Education the school counseling plan, and we have combined it with the Counseling Advisory Committee work as well tonight. You can go to the next slide. School, oh, no. school counselors design and deliver school counseling programs that improve student outcomes. The ASCA national model, which is the American School Counselor Association, a framework for school counseling programs, outlines the components of a school counseling program that is integral to the school's academic mission and is, to, is, and is created to have a significant positive impact on student achievement, attendance, and discipline. The Ask a National Model guides our school counselors at Shen in the development of school counseling programs that are based on data-informed decision-making, are delivered to all students systematically, include a developmentally appropriate curriculum focused on the mindsets and behaviors all students need for post-secondary readiness and success, work to close achievement and opportunity gaps, and result in improved student achievement attendance and discipline. Before I turn it over to Mr. Agostinoni, I just wanna note the Board of Education has a, a summary from the elementary, middle school and high school. This is new this year and we'll talk about that in a little bit. In addition, you also have the school counseling plan which has been updated to reflect the changes in um, with the ASK model and in our work and those are highlighted in yellow. I will turn that the next slide over to Mr. Gustinoni. Thank you, Mrs. Carmen. As you can see, uh, uh, those bubbles on the screen there, they represent some of the roles the counselors, the, the primary roles our counselors serve. Uh, what we like to point out is the, the counseling position is complex and ever evolving, and, and not only evolving on a yearly basis or um, monthly basis, but daily. So th those things you see on the screen can change um, given the student who walks in the door, given the student they have an appointment with, given the student they're meeting virtually with, um, as situations change, so do those roles. So those are the things that our counselors are doing and meeting with students and all pushing towards quality outcomes. And, and you'll hear us say, um, and Dr. Robinson say many times, equity in outcomes. And, and, and to address those needs for students, um, we have to be ever evolving. So that's what our counselors do. So um, I just wanted to illustrate that what you see on the screen does change per student and, and it will be different day to day, student to student. So it's, it's an important and difficult job to be able to adjust on the fly and our counselors do that. So I, I think I heard in a presentation earlier, um, if, if those bubbles could grow in size and shrink and grow and move around the screen, um, if we could get that um, diagram going, that, that is describing the counselor's job on a daily basis. You can go to the next slide. So the K-12 counseling program is consistently focused on a continuous improvement we're always involving to best meet the needs of all of our students, the unique needs of our students. Um, and also we're consistently reflecting and making sure that we're implementing best practices. Um, there's many facets at both the elementary, middle and high school levels, but tonight we just wanna focus on some of those key areas to share with you. So we're gonna begin at the elementary level. Ms. Jacqueline uh, Francini will present first and then Amy Quinlevin. Okay, so at the elementary level, we are continuing to consult and collaborate with all of our staff, students and families. We participate on our instructional support teams. We take part in the fifth to sixth grade transition meetings with the middle school counselors. Um, those have happened virtually this year. We are continuing to do individual and small group counseling. Um, that is also continuing virtually as well as classroom lessons. We are doing resilience builder groups, second step lessons to name a few. For the career college exploration lessons, uh, this unit is typically taking place in May. So with the distant learning, we have had to uh, make a few tweaks with that. So this year we are hosting a virtual career spirit week next week um, where we're having students dress up each day um, just to kind of get them thinking about career and college readiness. And we are also including career awareness lessons in our fourth and fifth grade Google classrooms. 
Now I'm going to turn it over to Amy Quinlivan for the social and emotional learning. Okay, thanks Jackie. So um, another one of the key areas um, that we talk about in elementary school counseling is the social emotional learning aspect. All elementary counselors provide classroom lessons in grades K through five on a variety of topics um, through programs like Jackie mentioned, such as Second Step. We address the five competencies of social emotional learning, including self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship and social awareness. Covering these competencies through classroom lessons help provide a foundation to enhance a student's ability to succeed, um, help enables a student to meet their goals and become a valuable member of society. As we continue um, in this remote learning environment, things do look different. We have small and um, individual counseling through Google Meet. We have virtual check-in systems and even with these changes happening, our three key areas remain our concentration at this time. Now I would like to introduce Karen Simone. Hi, so for at the middle school level, focusing in our on our academic piece, um, while the middle school counselors have always met with students individually or in small groups or in larger classroom settings, this is the first year that the new Part 100 standards have come into play. So this is the first year that the school counselors are meeting at a minimum of one-on-one -on -one with all students grades six, seven, and eight. And again, we have been doing that in the past, but this way is a more streamlined approach that we know every counselor in every building are doing these annual reviews. Um, we're focusing in on the social emotional piece, the academic piece, and the college and career readiness piece through these meetings. We started these meetings kicking off right in September, and we've continued with them through while being home. While we're home for COVID, we're still carrying on our annual reviews, just like the elementary school, whether it be through through our one-on-one um, -on -one Google Meets. And our college and career readiness at the middle school too with being home was unfortunately canceled. Um, it was supposed to take place in March. So um, we decided even though it was canceled, we were still going to do our career day and it's being done virtually and it's been really great. Um, the seventh graders are hearing different presentations from different people in the community and different careers um, in just different areas of life, just to get them thinking about that college and career readiness. And they're being posted regularly in the counselor's Google classrooms for the students to be able to view at any time. And it's been going so well. I do think that we'll continue to have these discussions on maybe even continuing with something like this, whether we're back to um, on-site learning or not. And I'm gonna turn it over to Don Shea, who was gonna talk more a little bit about the middle school social emotional learning. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, my name is Donald Shea. I'm the eighth grade school counselor at CODA right now. Uh, biggest thing I think right now is the social emotional piece of just making sure that the kids are doing okay um, within their families. Um, but that's throughout whether COVID was going on or not. Um, I feel like what's great about the middle school is watching, I have the eighth graders right now, I had them for sixth, seventh and eighth and seeing the growth of them uh, socially, emotionally, and then unfortunately not being able to say goodbye to them right now at the end of the eighth grade the right way. But it's 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 a, it's amazing um, to watch the growth of kids in middle schools. And I think what's different than the elementary schools is they don't necessarily are gonna come right out and say, I need your help. You kind of have to engage them and say, how can you, you know, how can we help you? And uh, for three years to have the kids like that, it, the growth has been amazing. And, and like I said, just trying to make sure they're doing okay right now is, is probably the number one priority of uh, what we're doing as far as counselors right now. So thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jess Irwin now. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Irwin and I'm one of the counselors at High School East. Myself and Megan Gifford will present as the high school representatives on the CAC. To address the academic needs of our students, um, we host individual academic advisement meetings, which of, of course can include things like course selection, but oftentimes they turn into um, much larger conversations. It often leads to conversations about post high school planning, their social emotional needs, balance, et cetera. Sophomore, junior, and senior interviews are conducted each year. Those conversations um, include both short and long-term goal setting, 
um, graduation requirement review. And new this year, we have very purposely tied in questions such as, what brings you joy and what do you do for fun? These questions have allowed us to much more creatively assist our students on their academic path. Counselors actively attend workshops, conferences, subscribe to newsletters, et cetera, to stay on top of graduation requirements and course programs and course offerings. Um, particularly this year, many changes have been made to graduation requirements because of the pandemic. So we are working very hard to ensure every student is benefiting from these changes. Counselors are also members of the instructional support team, but on a daily basis, we work to create academic support plans for our students, including facilitating peer tutoring, ensuring they are aware of resource, resources available to them, both in-house and in the community, and now making sure that they are aware of virtual resources. And I will pass over to Megan Gifford. Thank you. To address the college and career needs of our students, we provide classroom presentations, parent programs, and individual conferences. Post high school planning looks different for each student at each grade level. We work with students one-on-one -on -one to help them develop plans that are in line with their goals and interests. We educate students about the variety of paths available to them, connect them to resources, and help them to complete the steps necessary to reach their goals. Every student goes through the process a little differently and at their own pace. We meet them where they are and support them throughout their journey. Counselors attend conferences and workshops. We regularly engage in professional development to stay up to date on the college and career landscape. We are each drawn to different conferences with different topics of interest, and then we share what we learn with our department, with our students, and with the school community. And our department maintains an active website, a Facebook page, and Google Classrooms. During the time of off-site learning, we have adopted different platforms to meet the needs of students. We now work individually with students through Google Meet and over the phone, and we created Google Classrooms for each grade level. College and career posts have included standardized testing updates, virtual college fair information, previously recorded parent programs, and videos we created this spring to emulate our classroom presentations. And now I'm going to pass it back to Jess Irwin to talk about the personal social component. So counselors conduct uh, personal counseling and crisis counseling to support the social emotional needs of our students. This is an essential part of our role, um, and now we are finding it's more prevalent than ever. We have students we work with very regularly, but we also are responsive to students who are in crisis. Many students, or I'm sorry, many situations include collaborating with the student support counselors, administrators, teachers, nurses, and oftentimes outside agencies. Counselors also attend conferences and workshops regarding mental health issues affecting adolescents. And then we share this information with each other, our colleagues during faculty meetings, or even just in casual conversations. Our role has really expanded due to the current situation in unimaginable ways. We are striving to support students, parents, our teaching colleagues, and overall the community at large, while also assisting in the creation of senior collaborations, scholarships, etc. And I will be passing on to Kathleen. So moving forward, our continued focus will be on remote learning, but also making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students utilizing this new platform. In addition to that, we are also going to have an increased emphasis on social emotional learning for our students. And as we all are yearning for um, a transition back to on-site learning um, and making plans for that, still uncertain what that will um, look like 100%, you know, we're very aware that there may be heightened anxiety from students as they do transition back to school um, and our job is to really work together to create an environment for students where they feel safe and secure as they transition back to school. So um, that's going to be a focus as well. And now if you wanna to progress to the next slide, I'll pass it to Mrs. Carmen. So to close for the presentation, uh, just real brief, you know, obviously as you can see throughout, just really focusing on a systems approach and not an individual approach. And with the counseling advisory um, committee, uh, Ron, myself, and Kathleen were new to it this year, and we really worked on some new agenda um, format and minutes and um, those annual documents that the Board of Education received. I'm not going to go into those, but you can link on those at another time. I'm going to turn it over now to Ron at this point so he can just um, wrap up the entire presentation. No, we just thank you for having the opportunity to present, and, and the goal you see there, it's important. Uh, goals transcend situations. So, 
Um, and that's what you had here is our goal, regardless of whether we were on site or off site. Um, so we thank you for the opportunity to uh, to present tonight and um, give it back to Superintendent Dr. Robinson. Thank you very much, Mr. August, Mr. Augustinone, and, um, and all the counselors. Thank you for your patience. Um, very comprehensive presentation. So, Mr. Presser, I'll continue. The next presentation we have. Hey, do, is, do you have any time for questions? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I just go ahead. Bob, uh, can I just make can I make one? Uh, sure. Can I just say one thing? I just want to acknowledge um, all the uh, counseling staff. You guys are going above and beyond to really be on top of all of our students, and it's very, very much appreciated. I know that it's, um, aside from what your regular jobs are, you guys are really on top of the mental health needs of some of these kids, which is on the rise. And so I appreciate all that you guys are doing for our community. So thank you. And I just like to echo Mrs. Miller's sentiments. Um, she and I have had the honors to work by your side, you know, serving on the CAC, um, which has been a pleasure to see the growth and the work of this committee um, evolve over the past several years and just continue to improve um, always with that motto of, you know, of excellence. And uh, you guys do not leave any stone unturned when thinking of our students. Um, just again, it's a pleasure knowing that you, you know, you put your, your, uh, knowledge behind it. You put your hearts behind it and your souls into everything. And I know I'm getting corny, but it truly means a lot. I have witnessed it as a parent myself with having three students that went through and the extra supports that they received. Um, and I hear it from other parents as well. So again, thank you to all of you um, and continue to do the great work. I know our students really um, respond to that and are, are in need of that. So thank you. Um, if, if there's no other questions from board members, a uh, question to uh, Mr. Gustinoni or Mrs. Drago. Uh, in the past, uh, we used the end of year survey with uh, the seniors. And I'm pretty sure this year it's extremely difficult to do that. But is that something you plan to use in the future when we're able to bring that forward? I thought that was very helpful to provide one or two things to really guide the discussions throughout the year. So, Mr. Augustinoni, I'm happy to answer that. We're actually revising that survey now, and that will be going out to all seniors next week. We're also going to be utilizing some of our administrative assistants in the counseling center to reach out specifically to students who do not complete the survey, just because we know that their insight is so valuable and their perspective based on their high school experience. So even though we are not on site, we will still be um, implementing that survey. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, go ahead, Dr. Actually, Robinson. For the next one. Actually, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, it just had to do with the very last slide of the presentation, we referenced the L population. And I just um, I was hoping to, to get a little bit more clarity in, in how it was gonna, um, um, so the, the specific was comment was specific to increase L students English language production and peer interaction, and I'm assuming it's that this goal is for um, um, in the remote learning environment. And, it, and I wasn't sure if if I missed this, but I was I was hoping that they could elaborate on that comment. I can speak to that as well, um, and then uh, Mr. Augustinoni, if if you wanted to. Um, meeting the needs of our L students was really important this year, and one of our High School West counselors um, began to work with members of the community and students in High School West to serve as ambassadors um, for our ELL students. Um, that's something that we want to continue next year and also expand upon in High School East, unfortunately. Um, it didn't work out as, as planned as we progress through the year and then transition to um, distance learning. But there was a lot of great ideas that were generated on things we could do to better create an environment that was welcoming to all of our students. And then Ron, if I think you wanted to say something as well, but that was um, definitely an area of focus for next year. Yeah, I was just going to point out, thank you, Kathleen, you said said it just about all of it, just pointing out that it's also a K-12 
kind of go in and the, the role counselors play in with our L's when they come in. A lot of times they, along with the NL teacher, they are they are the point people for the family. So um, making that a goal and, and, and consolidating resources, having conversations around is really important to our counselors and important to our students and in our community. Also, if I can just add quickly, I'd be remiss if I didn't, that Sarah Chaffee was very instrumental in working with our counselors and myself in trying to create documents and resources online for our ELL students and their families um, because we're able to utilize uh, translators when we have new students come into the district, but then sometimes we found ourselves at a disadvantage once the student was in our building and having resources and being able to work with those students. So she was really helpful in trying to help us update documents and ways, mechanisms, I guess I should say, in communicating with families. Thank you. Excuse me, any, any other questions from the board? Okay, if, if not, Dr. Robinson, thank you very much. And I think we can move on to the next topic. Uh, thanks, Mr. Preston. So again, I'm going to, um, this is a video um, presentation. So I'm going to have Mr. McDermott um, queue up the library video. And again, I'm asking people if you could turn off your microphones um, so we can avoid the background feedback. My name is Joy and I am a parent and a library volunteer at the Shadokan Library. Libraries are super important to me. When I first came to America in 1988, I did not know how to speak English and I also had a really hard time reading the English language and my teacher actually introduced me to a public library and it just opened up a whole new world for me and i think it's wonderful because when i go to the shadokan library i know mrs check Mackis always has like a bunch of new books out she is super open and helpful to all the kids that come in and very very um good at recommending new books and so it just fills me with joy whenever I go visit the Shadokan Library. Also, this is my son Jude Hi. and Seth. Hi. And I love all the makerspace things. And also, it's a place for my class for when we do our newspaper. The best thing I like about the library is the books. I and mean, it's really quiet there sometimes. It just fills me with joy also, this is my son, Jude, and Seth, and... Hi, my name is Rita Hausman, and I am a seventh grade English teacher at Guana Middle School. Someone and I really just microphone, wanted please. to express my gratitude uh, to the library system here at Shen and the librarians for everything they do for students and teachers. When we were in the building, uh, visits to the library were very common for research skill, presentations on plagiarism, on citing sources, on how to access reference materials. We attended the library for book talks, and now a lot of those types of presentations continue virtually. I have been able to access Sora, which is an online platform for eBooks. Thanks to the librarians, we can access Scribd. My students and I will have questions regarding books or again, reference materials and librarians are able to offer those resources to us. And honestly, just the connection between libraries and the connection to the Clifton Park Library community, um, author visits, and um, ultimately the library is a safe place for kids. It is a place of refuge and especially for middle school, that matters. I go, I am in sixth grade and I attend Coda Middle School. And one of the ways I've interacted with the libraries at the middle school is during ninth period A days. I would go with some friends from other schools to go on a library, do homework, and play checkers while still in the study hall setting. Another way I've interacted with the library is giving back to my elementary school by helping out at the library at Scano by shelving and checking in books on Friday mornings. One of my most favorite moments with Mrs. Kravimon is the battle of the books, reading and getting to compete with my friend.
Let's talk about note-taking for our fourth grade project. To do this, you're going to need your note-taking sheet. And on the note-taking sheet, you'll put your name and your topic. Librarians wear many hats, such as resource curator, technology expert, event planner, and reading advocates, equity champions, program managers, and so many more. For school librarians, there is no greater hat to wear than that of the teacher. So who is your character? Uh, Jessica. And what are you writing next to Jessica's hands? Okay. And then she's kind of gullible. Why do you think she's gullible? Because she's lured in by a lot of schemes. Like peer pressure? Yes. She's susceptible to peer pressure. Jana, why are we all doing this together for just one leaf rather than making our own leaves? Awesome. So are we are we working as a community right now? Yes. Awesome. Keep going. Hi, my name is Alexa Dockett, and the West Library has helped me a lot. I went to Mrs. Melitia to ask her, because I was lost in my research, I didn't know where to start. I was a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and she calmed me down, she created, helped me create a folder so I could remain organized throughout the whole process. And she also helped me find some online sources and some online articles that were really helpful. And then helped me out when I needed help citing those sources. Also, I just want to say that the library staff is always so welcoming. Um, all of them are, and I feel so comfortable going into them and asking them for help. Um, a lot of people in the library staff, they help me find books to help research my oral, not just Miss Melitia, like other people did too. And they always give me the nicest greeting when I come in for my study halls and it makes me feel welcome there. So. School libraries are important because they have all sorts of different books. They're great for learning and researching topics. I love to go around the library and look for all sorts of different books. But when I can't find a book that I'm looking for, I like to ask the librarians. Going to the library is one of my favorite parts of the whole school day. Whatever the future may bring, Shen librarians are ready to embrace change and adapt to the evolving needs of our students and colleagues. We stand prepared as teachers, innovators, and leaders to reimagine and advance learning for the entire Shen community, delivering resources and facilitating equitable access and confident use for all. 
thank you to the administrators, Board of Education, and community for their steadfast and continued support. But thank you, most of all, to the students who always show us the way forward. So those are some of the reasons why we love the library. And I just think it's a super special and important place where kids can learn and not only learn, but also fall in love with reading for the rest of their life. Thank you, Ken. Mr. Presley? Uh, any, any other questions or comments from the board member? That was quite a video. Go ahead, please. I, um, I first wanted to, to say that was, that was great. I know Joy Shard, she's, she's, um, she's amazing. Her boys are amazing. They're over at Shard. But I wanted to point out, I saw someone in the video that um, was really pleasant surprise. It's Jerry Kraft. I saw him with the Scano librarians. Um, he has been coming to this district for many years. He's an incredibly giving person. He's a bestseller uh, um, with his book, The New Kid, but he also is a syndicated cartoonist for Mama's Boys. And But I wanted to, to mention that he, 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 even though he's accomplished a lot, he's made himself available for this, this district. And I was really happy to see him in the video. And the, his recent accomplishment is that he is a 2020 Newberry Award winner. Um, so, I, but it, the video isn't just about him, but it just shows that, that our librarians, that they're doing a lot of great things with the makerspace, with bringing uh, people into the district, exposing our children to, um, to, to, to things they otherwise would not have an opportunity to do. So um, thank you for that. I did have one question I wanted to ask, and that is specific to um, access to our libraries and facilities over the summer. And then um, how do you foresee that working because we're going into remote summer school, and also with um, in the fall, if it's hybrid or something to that effect, how can we um, continue to make um, these resources available to our student population? Hi, I'm Susan Kirby Lamont from Scano. I'd be happy to um, answer that. Um, so we, are, this conversation is alive and well at so many levels, right? And we too have been, trying to plan for whatever scenario is coming our way. We work very closely with the Clifton Park Half Moon Public Library and have already started to plan with them to support um, student reading and all of our goals for summer, which the goals haven't changed, just the methods have. One of the things that we've been talking about is how to best make our suggested reading list for summer. It's never a required list. Really, we just want kids to read. They should read whatever they want. We can't say that enough. We're subversive about it and passionate about it. Um, and just talking about potential curbside pickup at the public library, perhaps starting midsummer, we're looking to ways to make sure that those resources, those suggested texts are available um, at, at any moment in print. We are, um, always evaluating our, our online collection, especially now our Sora eBooks. We work with BOCI school library systems and we are just kind of waiting, funny that tonight was a budget conversation, to see when um, after July 1st, of course, we would be able to perhaps move some of those funds around to better boost those texts. And we know how important the online um, collection is, not just because we're virtual and working remotely at this point in time, but also because we, we really are champions for equity and access for all of our kids. And many resources are in eBooks. And when we, you know, you can make that print larger, all sorts of things that we can do to make the access points easier for children. Mr. Presley, thank you, Mrs. Lamont. Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Lamont. I appreciate that. Thank you for letting us present. You're welcome. Any other uh, questions or comments from the board? OK. Dr. Robinson, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Preston. So our last presentation tonight, first of all, thank you very much for the board, the indulgence. Thank you very much for all our presenters. 
we have Dr. Wood, um, who will make an overview of some courses and textbooks from IPAC. And so I'm going to switch screens and allow Dr. Wood to transition to that presentation. Thank you. So uh, throughout the year, teachers and administrators are working on making enhancements to the instructional program. Uh, there is an extensive process to propose new courses or significant shifts to existing courses and or request the purchase of entirely new textbooks or instructional materials. Uh, the textbooks that I'm referring to in this case are the ones that serve as the backbone for the instructional program. And so as teachers and administrators work on making and proposing these program revisions, uh, they fill out a number of documents, they do extensive research, and then eventually they present this to um, teachers and department members, and it eventually comes to IPAC as well. IPAC is our Instructional Program Advisory Council. Uh, they serve as a sounding board uh, to these um, the, updates to courses, new courses, um, textbooks, instructional materials. Uh, and so I would like to thank IPAC members for their dedication uh, to providing really high quality feedback. I have to say when we take presentations and textbooks or what, whatever we're taking to IPAC, things get better as a result of the feedback from that group of folks. I also wanna thank the teachers and administrators behind these proposals and adjustments because um, it really does make a positive impact on our system overall. And we know that that's what we're about, is um, we are uh, committed to continuous improvement. So the first um, is our forensic science. We, we have offered for many years a forensic science course at the high school uh, and uh, recently have been hearing from students that, boy, they go on to college and they take a very similar course, many students. And so happens that University of Albany offers a very similar course. Um, a few of our teachers investigated, uh, as did uh, Jean Lorch, and they worked with the college to um, move forward in the, the, the steps required so that our Shenandoah Forensic Science course can become or is in the pipeline to become accredited through the University of Albany. So students, uh, once that becomes fully approved through the university, will be able to apply for college credit should they choose to. Uh, they don't have to when taking that forensic science, but we believe that that's a nice option for many students uh, for the forensic science course. Um, the second update that was presented uh, or is moving forward in the pipeline for a change this year and presented to IPAC is the community-based work program. Our community-based work program has been offered in Shenandoah for years and years. Um, students with special needs at the high school go out into the community and learn workforce readiness skills. Um, you know, sometimes some fresh eyes and, um, you know, our teachers really thinking outside the box. They come up with really uh, great enhancements. And for this one, the enhancement is to make it a credit bearing course. It fits all the requirements of a credit bearing course. It's one of those we step back and say, we don't know why we didn't do this before, um, aside from now that it, it fits into um, some of the graduation credentials for students. Uh, and so making uh, the community-based work program a credit bearing course makes a lot of sense to us and certainly um, shows the respect to the students who are doing a lot of quality uh, learning in these classes. Also presented to IPAC was the alternative schedule uh, presentation, and that was one of the next steps in terms of moving the alternative schedule or block scheduling conversation 612 forward in the process. Um, all along, we've talked about the fact that the implementation for the, the intention is to implement in the 2021-22 school year. Uh, and so IPAC heard a, a comprehensive presentation from the alternative scheduling committee itself, the steps that have been taken over the last uh, almost year and a half of the committee meeting uh, and what it would look like uh, when operationalized conceptually at the high school. There were great questions, really um, good conversation surrounding um, the block schedule and in general terms, um, IPAC supported the move to a block schedule. Uh, that work is not yet complete. Uh, we will continue to review the feedback from the middle school and high school faculty uh, because presentations have been made at both the middle school and high school faculty meetings, uh, examining room utilization. Uh, we're gonna be conducting a review of the contract and ensuring ongoing communications with 
uh, students and families and teachers uh, and the larger community as well. And we also have some new textbooks and instructional materials. The first one uh, is a replacement to our existing Spanish uh, textbooks, or it's really many of them are hardly textbooks anymore, but online instructional materials. And so we will uh, be, we've looked thoroughly at what was available and the Spanish teachers in particular task force of teachers selected the SOMOS instructional materials. Um, they were very thorough in their review and did uh, even visit school districts in the region using the SOMOS instructional materials um, and feel very confident that uh, this, this document or these instructional materials really align with the world language standards that are going to be issued by the State Education Department in the, in the next few years. Um, also, uh, was an ENL standalone program. So that's English as a new language. As you know, um, our students who enter the school district who are not yet proficient in English are assessed and they um, are assessed to come up in, at different levels. Those with the most beginning um, stages toward learning English uh, receive under state guidelines what's called an ENL standalone program. In other words, they receive their English as a new language just from an ENL teacher alone in a separate space where they can really focus on developing their English skills. As they progress in that continuum to become more proficient in English, they begin to receive more of that instruction in the classroom with their peers. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're with their peers the rest of the day, but their ENL classroom instruction is actually in a separate space. And so it is for students receiving it as a standalone that we would be adopting this National Geographic materials uh, to support the ENL standalone program because it provides some continuity, teacher to teacher, grade level to grade level, and great exposure to developing English. So those are overview, that's an overview of our updates to Shenandoah courses and new textbooks slash instructional materials. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I do want to thank um, and mention that both uh, Christina Rajat and Naomi Hoffman are the Board of Education representatives to IPAC uh, and um, very much value their feedback there. And also, you know, the work of the administrators and teachers and IPAC members who've done all this legwork thus far. Okay. Uh, so any board members with specific questions for Dr. Uh -huh. Wood? Uh, Bob, yes, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's pretty clear that there are, are substantial advantages to block scheduling when we're talking about conventional in-classroom instruction. We are faced with, the, with multiple possibilities, uh, which include hybrid in, instruction, perhaps even predominantly virtual instruction. In that context, does block scheduling still have the advantages over the more conventional uh, organization? So um, let me just, just put a little context, Mr. Delava. Great question. And it's a question that quite frankly, we have thought about quite a bit as we're going through this running various scenarios as you alluded to. Um, and so put in context that, that maximization of, of space, staff, and time will be the priority as we transition to whatever that new norm will look like. <laughs> Consequently, um, as we have looked at block scheduling, it was actually focused on the same primary tenets, maximization of space, staff, and time to create a deeper learning environment and experience for our kids. And so I, I think it's, you know, like many things that we have done prior to the COVID situation has positioned us in a place that we can better transition and pivot to whatever that new environment might be. Um, and certainly a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of the research from the block scheduling, a lot of the hypothetical situation that we have gone through puts, in us, puts us in a situation that if we are compelled, be it by state regulations or otherwise, to, to create a different type of um, experience, school experience, scheduled experience for kids, we're in a better situation to pivot than we were 18 months ago. Um, so, so, so that's the benefit of where we are right now. 
Will we have to pivot one way or the other? That's the big question mark yet to be <clears> answered. <throat> However, we're certainly in a better position to pivot as a result of the things that we have done and also the infrastructure that we've put in place to provide professional development and things as we move forward as well. So so, so in a, in a, in a more general context, uh, we're primed to, to maximize the lessons learned um, as we build forward. I don't know if Dr. Wood wants to, to add to that at, at all. Uh, yes, that helps. Uh, I guess I was probably thinking in terms of uh, the effectiveness of instruction via computer uh, in terms of blocks of time, uh, span of attention and so forth. So yes, obviously some forces or organizations outside our own district may limit the choices we have, but under a situation where it was our choice, uh, are we looking at the advisability of large blocks of time via the computer as opposed to maybe sh shorter blocks of time? So we've thought long and hard about it. And when we, the other thing that is informing our thinking on this is feedback that we've gotten from students and families since March 13th. And one of those initial surveys that we did uh, talked to us uh, where students and families talked about how students were struggling managing eight or nine different transitions in the digital world, in the online world. Uh, and so we, and it wasn't just a Shen thing, but really the Capital Region BOCES work, if you look at um, some of that work, there was really a suggestion that we help kids chunk it out and not just for middle schoolers or elementary, but even for our high school students as well. And so a number of districts uh, started giving recommendations to their teachers saying, or asking their high schools or their middle schools to help students sort through what feels like you're being absolutely overwhelmed if you sit in front of your computer and get email from eight different teachers um, with eight different assignments due and eight different Google Meets, um, it was it was too much. And so while there are certainly concerns about the longer class blocks online, of really greater concern was the number of transitions and the um, mental organization required to organize themselves across eight classes every day where the block would help streamline that. And the other thing we've heard is that teachers are really starting to effectively use group work in the online space, or we come together as a class, you then have breakout, like time to work on your own. I stay on the line and I serve as a resource to you. you then we come back together and reflect. So there are a number of ways to break up um, the block without having any student have to listen for an hour and a half straight to some sort of lecture. You know, that, that's definitely not a model we're looking to have in place. Thank you. Uh, if, I could, if I could just add, Gary, uh, we met back on, um, it was April, and and at that point in time, they had, um, Dr. Wood had made the shift toward something that is more like block scheduling for the remote learners. And it also gave us an opportunity to hear feedback from um, teachers and others as to what was working and what was not working. So. I agree with what Dr. Wood and Dr. Robinson are, are sharing in that it's giving us a unique opportunity to see how this is gonna work going forward, but it's definitely a better model right now in the, in, in the remote learning world. Or it's that, that's what we're seeing. I, I, I'm seeing it, you know, having a, um, a son here at home, but also with the, the other feedback that we're getting. Any other comments, questions on the presentation? If not, I, I think we're done. So uh, we're done with the superintendent's comments. Let's switch over to uh, action items. And can we put the agenda up, please? And while we'll do that, uh, I'll looking on a different sheet. So there are two items here. The first one is approval of chief inspector and election inspectors. So something we need to do for the budget. Uh, can I have a motion to approve this one? Motion. Uh, I heard Mrs. Rajat first, uh, Mrs. Yeah. Hoffman second. Any comments or questions on the document? If not, uh, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Do we have any nays? 
No nays. It carries. The eyes have it. And the second one is approval of textbooks, which we just saw. Uh, can I have a motion to bring this one to the floor? Mrs. Motion. Anybody second? Second. Uh, I second. Jack, second. And so any comments or questions on the textbook uh, part? No more comments or questions. So all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any nays? I hear no nays. Therefore, uh, the motion passes. So uh, at that point, we're done with the two action items. Uh, and I think a uh, very long, fairly long meeting uh, over online, uh, definitely time to uh, pass on uh, to another meeting. So can I have a motion for the adjournment? Yes. Motion to adjourn. Hoffman first, I heard Mr. Gilbert second. You said a big yes. And so uh, all in favor to adjourn. Raise your hand, say aye. 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 Any nays? Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you very much and have a great day. Good night all. Thank you. Good night all. Good night. All. Good night. Good night.